how that all plays out later. But in a way, this was an idea that was somewhat ahead of its time, although by that point, of course, the New York Registry was emerging, the Pennsylvania Registry was emerging, and of course it was a few years after HICFA and STS uh, actually came into being. So the law, and I think that is unique because you will find that few, if any, other registries have actually been mandated by a federal statute. In this case, Mr. Wyden saw to it that there is actually a law on the books that encumbers and mandates uh, the fertility industry to report its clinical outcome in a way that would be transparent to everybody. Uh, of course, patients, but also providers and payers. Uh, the substance of the law, and you can reduce it into two objectives. One was to be sure that the reproductive community reports the pregnancy success rates of each and every clinic for the public to see so they can compare, so they can shop, so they can look for the best that they can find. And two, to ensure that the embryo laboratory involved has been certified and what the certification status of that laboratory actually is. So this particular law, which clearly was driven by patient-centered considerations, was there to facilitate a lot of couples afflicted with infertility who were seeking a credible place to go to to seek the promotion of fertility in their particular case. The law, in more specific terms, mandated, and now we're talking about pregnancy success rates, mandated that by 1994, each assisted reproductive technology program shall annually report through the CDC pregnancy success rates achieved by such a program. And it further mandated that effective 1995, the CDC annually publish and distribute the pregnancy success rates of all ART programs. On the embryo laboratory certification side, the law mandated the development of certification programs for embryo laboratories by the states or by appropriate accrediting organizations. Mandated that effective 1995, the CDC annually publish and distribute in this context the identity of each embryo laboratory used and the accreditation status thereof, and those ART programs which failed to report as required. In a word, there were a few, but probably in retrospect, insufficient teeth attached to this bill. For example, in the context of reporting clinic-specific pregnancy success rates, uh, the only teeth that were attached to the bill was the provision that those clinics that failed to report the success rate be listed publicly as such, that is to say, as non-reporters, using the tried and true blame and shame principle, but there was really no other uh, provision uh, attached to the bill that would allow the state or the federal government or regulatory agency to, in effect, force the reporting of clinic-specific success rates. Slightly more significant teeth were attached to the embryology laboratory certification issue such that the law stated that in the event of non-compliance, certification, misrepresentation, or refusal to permit inspection of embryology laboratories, the HHS secretary 
is directed or authorized to notify the state, make the inspection results available to the public, and revoke the approval of the state certification program or of the accrediting organization. I'm not aware that this ever actually transpired, but the provisions are there for the government to step in if the embryo, the all important, I should say, embryology laboratory is not up to par, which is to say has in one way or another not done what it needs to do to be sure that it's the best that it can be. So the attributes, I might say, of this particular to be or would be registry at this time is that it constitutes a peculiar statutory voluntary hybrid. By that I mean it's obviously statutory in the sense that we now have a bill uh, that is a federal bill that is clearly of relevance to our discussion today, but it's a bill that has limited teeth in the sense that you cannot enforce reporting of clinic-specific pregnancy rates. And the fact that we are reporting there today, that today is really because of a voluntary effort on the part of the reproductive community, and I'll get into that in just a minute. Uh, there really is no requirement for a clinic to report, or at least there's no ability of us to make them report uh, in that respect. So we're dealing with a hybrid. And another way of putting it is that in this case at least, the modus operandi of this registry is of a public-private partnership, that is to say between the CDC and the assisted reproductive technology community. As we dig a little deeper into this, I will go on to say that without the ART community participation, the voluntary participation, there wouldn't be a registry because we can't force it. It's something that the reproductive community on its own volition decided it wanted to do and work closely with the CDC to make this happen. This is a national rather than a regional registry, so unlike the New York State registry we mentioned earlier, this is a national registry, although the report breaks down the data by state and by clinic, and you'll be able to see that in a minute. It's about clinical outcomes, not about process measures. So it's about what we really want to know, not about some predetermined measure of quality or otherwise, what actually happens. And in a sense, it is a one-stop shop database or a data-rich portal that anybody and everybody can access by simply logging onto the internet. And I'll illustrate this in a series of slides. The kind of information you will find there, and this is a limited selection, is the procedural volumes that each clinic undertakes. And how many cycles do they actually cancel? That is always also a useful information. What are the pregnancy success rates broken down by maternal age? What are the live birth rates per cycle, per oocyte retrieval, or per embryo transfer? How many embryos do these laboratories uh, transfer, which has a lot to do with the multiple birth problem that we will get into a little bit later? What are the implantation rates, which is a reflection of the quality of the laboratory in many ways? What is the incidence of multiple pregnancies and birth? What is the accreditation status of the embryo laboratories? And who is not reporting out there, such that you may or may not choose not to use the services of that laboratory if you so chose? Here is what it looks like on the web. This is the, one of the web pages of the CDC Assisted Reproductive Technology site. And if you chose, 
for example, to look at the 2010 report, uh, which would specifically give you the fertility clinic success rates. And I chose to show you, this is the cover of the report that you will get. And I specifically am highlighting a, pro a program from Rhode Island. There's one IVF clinic in Rhode Island. There are probably five or seven uh, in North Carolina, which you could look up as well. And if you just uh, take a minute to scan through it, you will see that the number of cycles for women under 35 is 216, 119 beyond, and so forth. It tells you the percentage of embryos transferred resulted in implantation, and we could go on down the line, including to services that are provided and other interesting features that are very useful to anybody who is actually in need of those services. And if you're specifically interested in the national aggregated picture, you can go to the appropriate report. This would be the national summary report. And this is, for example, the national summary data that's at the front of the report that tells you that in the United States uh, in 2010, we did uh, approximately 41,000 cycles in women under 35, and by the time you add this all up, we have done approximately 150,000 or so cycles nationwide. And as you go deeper into the report, there'll be approximately 100 pages replete with graphs and tables that analyze the data any which way you can think of and provide a great deal of insight in an aggregated fashion. That is not provided, obviously, for a clinic-specific situation, but is a rich data source for anybody interested in multiple facets of this, which we won't have time to get into. Lastly, one important feature of this database is that it is validated or vetted or audited, perhaps not perfectly, but there is a concerted effort to ensure that the data are credible. So you have on the one hand the imprimatur of the CDC, which as you know, is the owner of our national public health data. Uh, this is just one of many, of course, that the CDC is home to. And at the same other, on the other side, you have a I think a sincere effort to validate or audit the data in the following way. Data are, are submitted in real time online to something known as the National ART Surveillance System of the CDC, thereby locking in the cycle as soon as it transpires so that any effort to, shall we say, change the results uh, retrospectively become more difficult to accomplish. Data of each ART program as it is being submitted annually must be verified by the relevant medical director whose name is listed on the report and who presumably signed the submission, thereby verifying to a degree the veracity and accuracy of the data. In addition, upon receipt at the CDC, the data are reviewed in-house and whatever uncovered errors are reconciled with the clinic by direct interaction between the CDC and the clinic in question. And then the data are further validated through joint CDC, and I'll get to start in a minute, that's a professional society, site visits to randomly selected ART programs. In 2010, just shy of 10% of all programs were site visited. And every year that is the case. So over time, obviously, uh, most programs have been site visited once, twice, or more. And during that 2010 site visits, uh, medical records were routinely abstracted for up to 40 randomly selected successful cycles and were carefully gone over, up to 20 randomly selected unsuccessful cycles, nationally about 446 randomly selected multiple gestation cycles, which we want to avoid, uh, 
and really constitute a problem we will discuss in a minute. And again, nationally, 135 embryo banking cycles, to mention a few. And unreported cycles, which is perhaps a continuously nagging issue uh, that represents an effort to really um, distort the data in a way that uh, it obviously misses the point of the exercise. So if I were to summarize up to this point, I would say that the CDC-based Assisted Reproductive Technology Initiative, which was launched effectively in 1997, at which point the first meaningful report was issued, constitutes, I would say in general, a little known national procedural outcome registry, which is now at the 14-year mark and learning. It's a learning system which I will not discuss in great detail, but suffice it to say that what you see in 2010 is not what you had in 1997. Constant improvements transpire as we go. The ART registry, which some have called ART Compare, has been serving, of course, patients, and I would say that's the primary target, but also providers, payers, and I would have to say commercial payers, because the government does not cover infertility, period. Uh, we can talk about that later. Researchers, of course, and policymakers, all of whom in principle could benefit from studying this database. Now, like many other databases or any other human undertakings, this uh, program is not without its shortcomings, and I wanted to list a few of those in the interest of balance. First of all, we continue to cope with the issue of non-reporting programs. In 2010, approximately 6.5 percent of 472 clinics that operated in the United States at that time uh, were non-reporters. For their own reasons, they chose not to report either to the professional society or to the CDC. We also need to recognize that this is a group level or clinic specific registry. It does not go down to the physician level like say the New York uh, cabbage registry did at the time and still does. There is no linkage or linkages of this database to other all important databases that would allow us to connect the process of assisted reproduction to development of the infants that are born and the potential positive or negative uh, impact of the circumstances or their birth on their ultimate development. There are some nascent efforts to do that in three states but for the most part uh, the data set is a standalone data set that is not linked to uh, newborns and infants and essentially lifelong monitoring of the development of the offspring. The database up until now, although that will change in 2011 and 20, uh, 2013 I should say, um, has not placed sufficient emphasis on singleton outcomes. If you are an infertile couple looking at the database and if you are concerned about the possibility of multiples, um, we want to emphasize those clinics that are good at producing singleton outcome because that's the optimal outcome. Uh, we realize that that may not happen all the time, but we want to optimize that, maximize that, emphasize that, and perhaps reward that in pay for performance programs as opposed to emphasizing the multiples. And I would have to say that uh, the CDC database for sure could be more friendly. Um, I refer to it here as user unfriendly. I'm not sure that's entirely fair, but uh, Lord knows times have moved beyond where we are uh, with that particular database. 
and they could well go beyond where they are right now to make the experience more user-friendly. Lastly, and perhaps more importantly, the assisted reproductive technology database, as it traces its origins in part to the legislation that Mr. Wyden uh, sponsored, constitutes effectively an unfunded mandate. In other words, Mr. Wyden had a vision. Uh, he put it into our law books, but there was no appropriation attached to it. And yet, he expected the CDC and the assisted reproductive community to come up with the goods. And as a result, uh, there is perhaps some room, I think, for us to discuss the funding in this case of this particular database. But frankly, there is a broader discussion of who should be funding registries beyond uh, this particular database. And that's a broader discussion, but that's a discourse that I think must take place. What we can learn, perhaps in a negative sense, from this experience, the unfunded mandate experience, is that in reality what's happening today is that one of the funders is the CDC itself, which contributes what I would say amounts to general operation of funds because there's nothing that's been appropriated that was dedicated to this cause. And they use those general operation of funds for the processing, analysis, validation, and reporting of clinic-specific data. Those of you who follow this stuff uh, recognize that the CDC has gone through several cycles of budget cuts in the last several years, and it's getting harder and harder to fund sort of small efforts, should this be viewed as such. Uh, there are really just a few people working on it at this time, and they're carrying the load. Uh, and there is no dedicated budget, and who knows what the future holds if a more dependable funding stream is not to be made available. And then the other party that, of course, uh, sustains this effort uh, are the clinics themselves. But because the costs are inevitably passed on to the patients as a cost of doing business, I would argue that in the final analysis, uh, the party that really is funding this effort is the patient community. So we have a situation whereby on the one hand we have the CDC contributing funds that it was mandated to set aside for this purpose and the patients who are carrying this as well. Clinics, uh, if you will, uh, are contributing by, of course, covering the cost of labor for the annual clinic-specific data collection and submission. And, of course, they pay relatively steep membership dues to a professional society known as SART, or the Society for Assisted Reproductive Technologies, which, as I mentioned earlier and will come to again, plays a central role in making this all happen. So they collect significant fees from the 470 or so clinics which are then used for the processing analysis validation reporting of clinic specific data. So at the end of the day this process is funded by a modest amount of operational funds by the CDC and a significant contribution what I think is ultimately the patients. I want to now turn to the indispensable role of SART, the Society for Assisted Reproductive Technology, a role that was not envisioned in the Wyden Law, but emerged as such, a role that SART actually undertook long before Wyden proposed its law, because that society has begun a nascent registry as far back as 1985. So, when Wyden actually emerged with his bill, there was already an ongoing effort to create a registry that was driven by the reproductive community, which was now, if you will, uh, formalized uh, and amplified through the introduction of the bill. So here's how it works, and it's 
an interesting and I would say at the same time peculiar evolution that's working or has been working this way now for the last 15 or 20 years. So 95% of clinics, that is to say 95% of the reporting clinics, report their data not to the CDC, but rather to this professional society, as they have done prior to the Wyden bill. However, the Society for Assisted Reproductive Technology, in turn, transfers those files to the CDC. It's complicated because they actually collect more data than the CDC actually uses or needs because they have their own ambitions and their own research agenda in mind. But nevertheless, they provide the CDC with 95% of the information that the Wyden Bill mandated the CDC to collect. And then about 5% of reporting clinics choose to report directly to the CDC for whatever reason uh, those are complex decisions that clinics make. Uh, in the end, the CDC ends up with 100% of the data and the professional society ends up with about 95% of the same. And this is shown in the last two rows of this slide. So we do have, in this situation, what I would say is effectively a registration duplication or a registry duplication. We have a CDC brand that uh, uh, some of us prefer, prefer to refer to, and there is the professional society which is inevitably conflicted. Uh, it's a dues-paying society that depends on its member for its livelihood. It's a lobbying organization. It's a variety of things that are not necessarily compatible with the maintenance of a registry, but they nevertheless play an indispensable role here with the ultimate arbitrator being the CDC. The CDC uh, registry was launched in 95, but as I mentioned, the professional society uh, really had the foresight to start this process back in 1986. They possess different fractions of the total data. Uh, I would say that the CDC has a rich set, set of data, but SART collects more information than CDC and therefore has a richer database. Access to the CDC is unlimited, but to SART it is member limited. So unless you're a member, you really can't access it. Research opportunities with the CDC tend to be collaborative and informal and really rely on interaction with staff. Whereas with SART, there is a formal process in place, but it has to be led by a SART member or it has to engage a SART member. The CDC is not conflicted, SART is, the CDC is not especially user-friendly, and frankly, SART is much more. And when practitioners sit in their clinic with the couples or prospective patients, and they discuss with them the performance of their clinic, the website they usually will pull up will not be the CDC website. It would be the SART website, which is much more user-friendly and much easier to discuss with the patient proper at the first meeting. Lastly, I will mention elements of data that uh, are not reported uh, and that uh, are currently not available. So the annual CDC ART report does not rank, rate, or otherwise directly compare ART programs in recognition of the divergent severity of their case mix and the variable scope of their services. That's the typical lingo you will run into when objections are raised by providers uh, with respect to registries. Um, there's obviously intrinsic truth to the fact that uh, uh, case severity varies and that risk adjustment is an imperfect science. 
but I'm not sure that it warrants a complete shutdown of the conversation and a preclusion of efforts to reach a point whereby some form of comparative analysis can in fact be reached. In some registries, you may be aware, the professional societies and the registry carrier have actually a contractual agreement which spells out these terms. In this case, I suspect it is an unwritten agreement uh, which the CDC is careful to monitor or to comply with because it is so highly dependent on the professional society for 95% of its data sources. So it's a complicated dance that is not optimal and I think I'm presenting it to you really without any uh, efforts to uh, uh, beautify it in any way. So at the end of this section of the presentation I will say that our nation will do well to expand public reporting efforts to include the outcomes of other medical and surgical procedures as I have so personally discovered and as many of you will discover if you ever need to seek assistance. Only in so doing will all patients accrue the information, analytical and policy forging benefits now afforded to those in need of infertility services and of course orthopedic services and cardiac services to mention a few. I would also argue that saddling patients with the underwriting of national registries is probably unfair, uh, at least as a sole contributor and probably unsustainable. Um, I think we have to have a conversation about it. As an opener, I would argue that other beneficiaries, perhaps providers, payer, researchers, must also contribute some to the costs of creating and maintaining these indispensable uh, databases. I mentioned briefly other federal parallels. Uh, they all came out later, but Nursing Home Compare came first in 1999 to be followed by Dialysis Facility Compare in 2001, Home Health Compare in 2003, Hospital Compare in 2004, and most recently, courtesy of the Affordable Care Act, physician compare, which is at this point a shell of a database, but obviously one for which some of us have high hopes for, but it will take a long time before it's meaningfully addressed. So that's the database, um, the good, the bad, and the ugly. The question is, has it done some good um, in the context of assisted reproduction has it guided our policy in any meaningful way? And has it resulted in quality improvement? And to partially illustrate this point, because cause and effect relationship in this context are very difficult to document, nevertheless, I'd like to show you one nagging issue of this field that one could argue the registry has made some tangible contribution to. But I wouldn't put it any stronger than that because it's very difficult, as you know, to link public reporting and the utility thereof to ultimate quality improvement in whichever field you're looking at. The reality of assisted reproduction is that it's done a lot of good. It was recognized by a Nobel Prize, as you know, in 2010, and it effectively vanquished infertility. But one of its unintended consequences was a multiple birth epidemic, which in the United States looks like this. If you look at the national twin birth rate in the United States between 1970 and 1980, which is to say before IVF reached our shores, the national twin birth rate was stable. And then, things began to happen. And we have seen a steady increase in the national twin birth rate between 1980 and about 2005. And then as a result of developments we will get into, we are now beginning to see a certain plateauing, flattening, cresting 
of this phenomenon, at least for twins. And in fact, in 2010, we had the first year in which the national twin birth rate actually declined, admittedly only in a minimal fashion, but at least it was heading in the right direction. In quantitative term, terms, this translates into an increase of 1.9 fold in the national twin birth rate from 1971 to a 2009 high. But finally, as I said, in the last five years, the annual growth increments decreased from 3% per year to about 0.5% per year or less. So maybe there is light at the end of the tunnel. I can see that I'm exceeding my welcome here. So I should stop pretty soon, right? Okay. So I'll probably skip <laughs> all of this and just say uh, a few things. I'm obviously uh, packaged more than we can deliver here. So faced with this unfortunate situation, society finally issued guidelines. And while you couldn't see the data, I can tell you that whether or not cause and effect relationship played a role here, we are beginning to move in the right direction, especially in the higher order national multiple birth rate. So we won't have time to discuss that. And I'm going to uh, stop here. I got carried away here, and I apologize for that. Uh, and maybe another time we can cover some of these other aspects. So thank you for putting up and for paying attention. Well, thanks. This is great. We'll have uh, time for a couple of questions. The, um, you know, the idea of, of public-private partnerships governing registries is really a unique aspect uh, of these data. You kind of alluded to the, you know, the, the difficulty of, of having a public partner uh, in this process. There's obviously, there's lots of opportunity for validation. How do you see, as you look at the landscape for other areas, you know, would you recommend the CDC or NIH being a partner, or should this be other groups that, uh, that carry the ball for this? So the answer is yes, I'm a firm believer in um, allowing a non-conflicted party to be home to some of these national assets, uh, whether it's the CDC or the NIH. Um, there really is no professional association out there that is not conflicted. Uh, by necessity, uh, these are dues-paying organizations. They depend on the hand that feeds them. And they're hard-pressed to take painful actions that would impact the livelihood of their members. And while they occasionally do the right thing, it's a hard thing for them to do. Uh, as you know, there are very few unconflicted institutions left uh, in the United States. Government is perhaps one of them, and the Institute of Medicine may be the last vestige of the same. So yes, I really believe strongly that we don't want the fox in the chicken coop. We want an uninterested neutral party overseeing the data as much as possible. It may not be always possible. Eric? So I too want to thank you for coming here. This is, is great to, to hear what you've gone through and what you've done and, and actually partly to us. Uh, I think you described it well as being almost hidden from the sight of many of us. I don't think many of us knew you or this registry existed. It does bring back a lot of the same exact memories that we deal with here uh, with regards to a lot of the cardiovascular registries that we've worked with and cardiovascular societies, to be honest, that we work with as well. Although I, I do take a little issue with a couple of your conclusions. Uh, I'm not, on the one hand, I'm not so sure that, that the, the registry meets its mandate. If the is, issue is actually to provide not just data, but true information or knowledge to the patient, I'm not exactly sure that your registry succeeds. Um, this is the equivalent of uh, companies having their, their books, quote unquote, open to the world, but with so much data that it is uninterpretable to the mm. average mm. consumer of that information. Mm. 
Secondarily is the issue that if the information is not adjusted um, nor compared in a direct fashion, the degree to which it really imparts on what the consumer wants, which is the best provider in the area that I could use, or is this provider better than the guy down the street, um, is it really succeeding in its goals? So that would be question one. And then question two related to that was who pays? And no matter what, somebody's going to pay. Um, you can argue about whether or not if you put it onto broader areas like society, it's somehow buried, but it's still in there. If you pass it on to payers, it's still going to be buried in their insurance rates that will be passed on to everybody. In this case, if it's a procedure that is more elective that a, that a couple has made together, it may actually be the one place in medicine where it perhaps is more attributable. <laughs> They've had to make a decision to, to invest um, in, in this. Um, not making a judgment call one way or another, but it, it's part of the cost, and part of the cost, they're getting the benefit of knowledge that, if they got the knowledge, <laughs> that this provider was better than that, then they perhaps should have paid for that knowledge. Well, thank you, and I would say that I fundamentally almost fully agree with your first point. Um, I think the data could be perhaps further refined so that they're more of utility, but I think that process has been going on. Um, I know that to an outsider that may seem still a little bit um, esoteric, but uh, the couples that uh, unfortunately in, encounter this challenge, uh, uh, they're quite sophisticated and, and really can digest the information that's currently on uh, the website. Um, the notion that we should do better in terms of what the public wants, which is to say meaningful comparisons of quality, I couldn't, couldn't agree more. Uh, that's the ultimate pushback that we're running into, of course, uh, in all of this. And some could argue that it's a miracle that we've gone as far as we have, considering what animus existed back in the 80s and the 90s for the very notion of shining light on the hallowed practice of a physician. Uh, as for the second point, I mean, I think it's, it's something we may want to debate. Um, I don't really know the answer myself. It was simply an intuitive reaction of mine that uh, I don't think of the patient as the one that necessarily should carry that responsibility of national registries of databases. Could it be a part of the solution, perhaps? Um, uh, but I really would like to see other parties who benefit from the database uh, provide uh, some of the uh, support to sustain it. Um, and um, uh, that, I think, is a, is, is a broader question. And I really would like to compare databases at this point and see what their business model is, who carries, uh, who actually ultimately pays, and does this make sense? Uh, I just presented the data as they are. Uh, this is just the way it's operating right now. Uh, the CDC could fold someday when somebody makes a decision that they just can't afford that anymore. Uh, I don't see the uh, IVF enterprise going anywhere. That's a longer story. Uh, it will do well, um, and it uh, should be able to provide its contribution to the patients or otherwise. Time will tell. I, I think that point, I would say, perhaps deserves a little more discussion. Um, Great. Well, thanks. That's, a, that's an interesting idea. You know, if you have a public-private partnership to catalyze this, can the professional society take it from there with the same rules uh, and perhaps. governance? Well, um, <laughs> we're, we're on uh, at the top of the hour. So, Ellie, thank you so much for joining us today. And thanks thank for a great presentation. Thank you. <laughs> I can't believe how... how